that we don't miss out on it. So tonight's session is to have a conversation. It's not just a one-way street. I want to have a conversation about Slovenian AZ beekeeping. Now, I realise to do that, to be able to have a conversation, there might not be much knowledge in the room to begin with, because I know we all follow some pretty similar standard ways of keeping bees. Um, and whilst the Slovenian system doesn't change the biology and the behaviour of bees, um, it's certainly a different experience for people who um, have kept bees traditionally in a Langstroth type system. So I think I better start tonight by giving you all a little bit of background on an Slovenian AZ, AZ beehives. But I want you to realise that I am absolutely no expert. I'm probably just 20 hours of YouTube videos and book reading and mucking around in front of you if, if, if you're not already further ahead than that. Um, so I, I point that out is that I'm new here. I'm curious as to whether or not there's value in creating a little bit of a cohort of people who want to talk more about this sort of stuff. But it also might be that you just enjoy the idea of having a conversation tonight and learning something new and that's it for you. That's cool as well. But I think we can do this differently, but I want to have a chat with people um, and learn more. So here we go. I'm going to share a, two, show, two presentations to, I think just to set the scene. And I'm completely happy with you tonight, we're only a small group anyway, is if you unmute and you want to say something, please do. Um, if you know something about this that I don't know, tonight's the night to speak to that because I'm learning as much as you guys probably are. But it all starts with this wonderful picture that's behind me right now. I'm hoping you can see a beautiful picture that sits there. Um, this is one of the ways that Slovenians keep their bees. And just that view alone is truly astonishing and amazing. And I, um, you, you see that and you can't help but be inspired and wonder what is going on there. Absolutely like an amazing way to, to soak this up. Um, and I'm just gonna break from my face for a moment and you can now see, see this here. And it's a really new, unique system and it probably already poses some thoughts for you in your mind of, gee, that's gonna be different. My beehives don't sit next to each other and neatly and tidily and packed in like that. I don't think my bees would like that. I don't think I'd like that. Or maybe you think the opposite way going, oh wow, that looks easy, that looks comfortable, that looks straightforward. Anyway, that's what we want to uncover a little bit um, and get a feel for tonight. Um, let's click forward a picture. And like, how can you not love something that is so visual and appealing? Um, it's got me... It had me curious from the first time I saw these beehives and I just sat there wondering why haven't I heard more about this and maybe just the voice of, the, of these type of beehives is not loud enough but at the same time I think the voice for how we are always supposed to keep beehives is the loudest one and that is is people constantly only talking about the one main sort of beehive which we all know as the Langstroth beehive. Um, not to say that that's all you guys would have. I know some of you have other sorts of bees. But I want tonight's conversation to be a little bit analytical. I want you to pose questions and pose some thoughts because there's going to be some things here which don't feel right for you, which is certainly not how you've done it in the past. And that's good. That's nice. Um, and like for, for starters, here is a real obvious example of... What, you know, you look at this and go, what's going on here? Is this like someone's cupboard into their, you know, is this their wine, wine cupboard or is this um, where they keep their, um, what they've got in their kitchen, you know, the nice plates and the cutlery away from um, <laughs> from the main part of the kitchen? No, this is the backside of those beehives that you're just looking at. And I'm sure it's already um, piquing your interest if you've not seen anything about this so far. But here's some things to think about in this conversation tonight. And I don't know the answers, by the way. I've got perspective, I've got an opinion, but I don't know for sure what the deal is. So I want us to look through some of the pros and cons of, of this type of system. We're gonna to try and figure out, is it better for the beekeeper? Is it easier for the bees? Is it easier to take honey if you want some honey? What's it like to deal with the pests and diseases that we currently deal with? I don't know, I don't know, honestly, I don't know the answer. Um, what about feeding bees? We know we need to do that from time to time, um, or maybe not everyone does, but it's not uncommon. 
And if you were inspired by this, like what's it, what sort of effort does it take to build one or to own a beehive like this? And if right now the only impression you've got of the first few photos I've shared with you, um, you're probably thinking, I can't afford a truck filled with beehives. That's cool. That's all right. I'm not proposing that that's where you start with this sort of thing. But they're the sort of conversations um, that I'm really curious about at the moment. And I think we've got um, an opportunity to um, learn more. But I'll share with some resources with you at the end as well of where I've been looking. This particular presentation, which I think sort of I'm going to whiz through fairly quickly so we can get to the conversation part. Um, I don't know who Mark Chorber is. I've been trying to get on, t on in touch with him so I could actually show this presentation with permission, but I haven't been able to come across who the whoever it is. And I find that this presentation is fairly freely available on the internet. So I figure if it's freely available, I'm entitled to show it to you and we can have a look together. So this is a presentation put together by Mark. He talks about where Slovenia is in, in the in first instance here. And um, I needed to really think about it. I knew I knew roughly where it was, but here we're talking about in a hilly and mountainous area between Croatia, Italy and Austria. Someone said to me only just earlier today, and I mean, don't look at that picture at the bottom to get the same impression, but for those, those that are familiar with Australia, I don't know Loretta if you're familiar with Tasmania, which is the state right down south. From a climate perspective, there is some similarity between uh, in Slovenia with Tasmania. So I just put that in the back of your mind as like, this is where, where it's worked well and, and done quite nicely for them. It might work well in Tasmania and other areas. Um, simply stunning, mountainous environment. Not something that's necessarily easy to transfer beehives over long distances easily the same way we do. But it's also quite a small country. Uh, beekeeping has been in that area for a very long time. The native bee, which I think it talks about in a moment um, there, is, is the European honeybee. Um, I've going to say I think it's the carniole and it'll correct me in a minute if it's not um, and that's the only bee species or subspecies that they're allowed that they are allowed to have there they're not allowed any other type of um, to, to have any other type of honeybee that's the only subspecies that they're allowed to have and I guess they've got the um, ability and freedom to be able to say that and say well that's what we're having because that is their native honeybee and there's some um, benefit in that in that of course in that it's suited to their environment really well but there's a range of, there's a bit of history here. The one point I show you here is the AZ hive is named after Anton. His name's down the bottom. I dare not try and pronounce his surname. And he was around not so long ago when you really think about it. Um, but it was his design and his name that brings about the, the name AZ hive. So it's only about 100 years old, this type of beehive system. Um, Langstroth, as we know, is probably 200 to 250 years old. I can't remember exactly where that fits, but it's a lot older. So this is new in respect to what a lot of us are working with. There you go, good. It is the carniolan and bee there. Uh, overwinters in small clusters and builds up really quickly. They don't. They really back off their growth when there's um, good when there's poor food around. Um, so they're really good at managing themselves. And as I said, that's the only type of bee that they'll allow in Slovenia. Um, it's kind of interesting. And fun fact down the bottom there, Deb, I don't know if you knew this one, Carniolans have the longest tongue of, of their species, allowing them to forage on a wider variety of flowers. Never even thought about that. That's like the first time that, that has ever popped into my mind. But I think <laughs> that's kind of cool. It's different, isn't it? Mm. <laughs> Um, I'm not going to go into the guy too much more other than he was uh, he's noted for it and it's his name. Let's just start to talk a bit more about it. So we don't need to know the ins and the outs and all the perfect details here tonight. This is just to help us with the conversation. So you can see here, there's sort of two sections really. There's an outer, outer wall around the hive and then there's an inner wall in essence. But there's not removable boxes like we'd be familiar with, with Langstroth hides. But the frames are removable. And the frames don't come out the top, they come out the back. They slide out the back. So when you think about that, it's already quite a different work process for you as the beekeeper. Um, they have openings at the front, and I've learnt that they really like to have multiple openings, not just at the bottom, which is where the main opening is, but for each level of frames that are in there. They like to have an opening. 
it's clever because this system has supporting steel rods at the bottom which is what the frames sit on and that just keeps them from not sitting flat on any surface it just means there's three small points at the bottom whereby the frames sit and at the ends um, at the front and the rear of the actual hive there's just small locators that means the frames stand up properly and stay in the same spot each time you slide them in and out so from a from the very simplicity of how do you use these it's quite simple sliding a frame in and out it gets located from both ends front and the rear with a uh, quite a simple system to hold it in place. It can be two levels, it can be three levels, it could even be more levels if you wanted it to. I'm building one in my garage right now and in about two weeks it should be ready to be able to put bees in it and it will be three levels high. Now the great thing is, and you can probably see, you might see it on the picture there, it says queen excluder. So there's a spot, there's a slot there that you can put a queen excluder through at any of the levels. But you can also put a board in there which is solid so no bees go higher than that particular point so in winter my preference is usually to have one brood box but if i wanted to i could have two but i can separate it and and, and make the area smaller and in fact some people even make it smaller from the sides and put some some boards in on the sides if they have a say a swarm that they've caught a very or a very small swarm that they wouldn't want all of the hives access, all of the frames accessible by accessible by the hive. There's a really interesting system at the back here. There's an outer door which gives you access to be able to look in at the rear without bees coming buzzing at you. Because each level has their own inner door which has fly wire over it, so you can look in and see what's going on without a bee coming in your way. So you just hopefully that gives you a really simple, and it's only meant to be simple at this point, understanding of how this system works. Um, what you see in these beautiful pictures, these stunning pictures, is many of these hives located next to each other. And one of the successful elements from what I've learnt is when you have hives together like this, they've got more thermal mass when they're together, so they have less loss of heat. They are more, uh, they, they actually overwinter stronger. Uh, they often have honey that is drier and you go what that, that is their moisture content ends up being when it's capped is actually lower than what it would be in a normal hive system where a beehive might be in isolation on its own so they actually do a better job of curing and preparing their honey in these types of hive systems so when you think about that their honey's in a better state they've got this thermal mass that sits around them they don't have the same weathering issues that we have. And when you see how it's built there, especially in the top left, you can see that it's actually really well sheltered and covered over. Um, and the same system applies there with the trucks, is that's how that works as well. Now, I don't know how you work around inside those trucks. I'm not too worried about that. I, mean, I don't personally intend on doing that at this point in time, but that gives you a bit of an idea. There's different ways that this can look. The version I'm sort of opting for at the moment is close to that one in the very middle there. I'm going to have two two hives next to each other, not not quite like not just a single like that is, and I think that, that might be two hives, one on top of each other. But I intend to have two three level hives, one next to each other on the same structure. But there's lots of different ways that that's done. But how can you not be like maybe no one, not everyone wants to build something like this, but you can't be inspired and curious about what you're looking at here. Um, so that's a very simple version of what this hive might look like. What is fascinating, and like I think it's one of the thrilling parts of this, is the way that Slovenians would um, create artwork on their hives. Now I've seen lots of flow hives being coloured and painted, and I've seen lots of things happen with lots of people's beehives, and I go, yeah, isn't that lovely? But I don't think much more of it than that. Um, but I get pretty excited about what these guys do. I don't know why this fascinates me more, but it absolutely does. Um, there's just so much, so, so much variety in what's done. And apparently, um, it's a shame to, to say this, but apparently there's quite a bit of theft of these paint of these paintings on the front of hives because of how amazing and beautiful they are. And they sell for quite a premium. Pretty unique. So there's just a quick view in the back of a beehive. 
you can see that those doors are removable and that's the inside door here. You can see the metal above and below the mesh area. That That's just a, a, a stamped metal guide, which is what I was talking about before, that locates the frames evenly spaced apart. Can you see behind that the, the, main, the main door is open at the top and the bottom? There's an opportunity just to drop down those doors and it allows for airflow. Probably not a bad thing when you think about it for our hot Australian summers. If, you've, if your bees are hot, um, apart from the fact they're well insulated in a system like this, but at least then you can create more ventilation. And I don't know if you're noticing here something different about these frames. They are different. Um, can you see at the very top? It's probably a bit hard to look at at the moment. Maybe I can bring it in a little bit. You can see that there's curve on the top. Well, the same curve exists on the bottom. And that's so that as they slide in and out on those three rods that you can imagine run at each level, there's minimal point that they can touch those rods. Realistically, there's only six tiny little points at the bottom where those rods come into contact with the bottom of each frame. And that's to reduce propolis so that they're as easy as possible to remove. Now, there can sometimes be a little bit of propolis on the ends, but from all accounts, it seems like if with this clever design, it, it overcomes a lot of those issues. Now, for my first one of these, I'm not building these frames. I'm, using, I'm building a beehive that is suit that will suit Langstroth frames because I just can't do everything the very first time. Plus, I just want to prove out some of the points of this first, and then I think it'd be nice to swap. Their frames are not as long, but they are a bit deeper. Um, so there's some subtle differences there. But it's very common to see these being hybrid beehives where they use Langstroth frames in, a, in this system. Um, I suppose that covers a little bit of that. How about, how about this point? I think this is probably one of the biggest sales points. Um, and obviously it's one of the pros when we're talking about this, but once your hive is in position, the heaviest thing you'll lift is a frame of honey. So three kilos of honey is about as heavy as something you would lift. Um, so I reckon that's a pretty good feature of this system. Now, I would think I'm pretty capable and strong, but I also don't like lifting 30 kilos of honey um, and thinking that that's a good idea. I'd much prefer to make my life e as easy as possible, and this system enables that. Just a few more slides. Yeah, there's, there's probably even a better view than the page before. You can see all the way in. You can see the three rods. You can see how they fit an excluder in, in the gap. So it's pretty simple when you really look at it. There's the comparison between the two frame sizes being the AZ and then behind it looks like the, looks like a modified Langstroth because it doesn't have the tabs on the end. Anyway, you get the point. Mm. They've got special, you know, they've got those screen doors. There's special feeders. I haven't figured out how they work completely yet. That's that's an exercise to come up. Think about putting feeding feed in that back section between the two the inner and the outer doors, you can feed the bees through there with, with certain methods. Um, it's easy to have a tray come slide in and out from the bottom. Um, so there's lots of simple methods here to make to make life pretty easy. Um, if you've got these in a house, this is often what they look like. Um, there's all the beehives on one side. You've got all of your other components that keep everything together over here. You work your bees from the back of the hive um, in this room as well, like as, as, as occasionally bees do fly into that space, they'll fly to the windows. You'd have little spots there which would allow them out and you wouldn't be hassled by too many bees. Just some of the real simple mechanisms. I'm, like I said, I'm not building this right now, um, but that's what happens. There you go, in a converted v um, van. <laughs> um, I've seen these pictures around before. Yeah of um, sort of that uh, therapeutic value of um, beekeeping inside a bee house. And I think I'm just gonna whiz through these last few because I think we've got to a lot of the main points. So it's pretty versatile. You could do just, you could um, really do everything you can with a Langstroth system. So you could create small little nukes, you could create you know larger and smaller hive systems. Um, but yeah, that's sort of where that's up to. I think that might be I don't want to talk through their advantages and disadvantages. I want us to talk through them ourselves. So 
Maybe I'm going to leave it at that. I might just get us a picture here. That might suit our needs. I might just pause there. What do you think is the first thing I want to say? I'm going to stop talking and let you guys have something to say. What do you reckon? I love the concept, the fact that you're not lifting those heavy weight supers off your hive. I think it's fantastic. My thought is uh, those frames don't look like they're wired, so how do they extract their honey from it? Um, I think that what you're seeing here, that's, I'm glad you brought that up, they actually do get wired frames. Um, and interestingly, uh, I don't know if you can see it on the screen, they wire them from top to bottom. Oh, okay. I don't know why. That's just what they do. So you might get seven, I think there's about seven wires running up from top to bottom. Um, that one doesn't look like it's got wire in it, but it's had bees on it. Uh, maybe that was a brood one that they weren't extracting, but good point, Deb. Mm. Uh, okay. What else did you pick up? I've been um, looking at these for a few years, actually, wow. and I've never felt confident with my woodworking skills to have a go. <laughs> the, the main advantage for, for me with them was, or the main appeal for me was actually the house because I get a lot of strong winds and, you know, it would open up more opportunities of days that you could do inspections, not having to wait for everything to be just right. Yeah. Um, I would probably suggest it's better to stick them onto, a, say, a, an old caravan or trailer bed because if you were going to build a house and you wanted to actually have it as a fixed structure, you would have to deal with a whole lot of council regulation to get that put in place. If you stick it on a caravan or a trailer, you don't really have to worry about any of that. So even if you had never moved it anywhere, yep. you would put it on there. But I also really like the idea of having the tools just there and not having to put everything onto the back of the car, drive out to your hives and work on your bees or even carry them from your shed to the way they are in your backyard. They're all just there in your bee house, you know. What's your thought, Andrew, about like, you with, with this system, unless you did have it on wheels and done properly, like able to move it around, you're really committing your bees to that location. You're probably not even able to change its orientation once you've put them there. Like you, you build it, even, um, I don't know how many pages I've got to go back, but it might just be worth making sure. I'm, even if you build something small like this, I don't, think, I don't think council's needing you to do anything for something little like these ones here. But once it's in the ground, it's in the ground. You aren't you're not moving that in a hurry, are you? No, that's right. But I think that's a that's that's the case for a lot of hobby beekeepers anyway. They probably wouldn't move their hives around very often if they're hobbyists. Um, so I suppose it comes down to clever site selection and orientation from. The yeah, that's right. I mean, I originally put my hives in an unsuitable location, so I did have to move them yep. um, after a couple of years. So yeah, that would be an issue. <laughs> yep. Yep. How do you reckon, um, do you reckon there'd be much difference from um, a honey extraction point of view? What do you, what, anyone got a sense of how that might work? Your point earlier, Deb, about the wires was obviously, um, I, might, I could fix, pick that up for you and mention that they do normally wire their frames. Like that's obviously one of the big reasons that we're in it for is to be able to, um, you know, have some honey occasionally. Yeah. It'd be nice if you could put a, uh, in instead of the queen excluder, or if you had a, a tray in between the super and the brood boxes, you could slide in a kind of a bee trap because um, otherwise you're going to have a lot of bees flying out that little escape window when you're extracting frames. Um, I'm curious yeah. to know how that goes, Andrew, because some of the videos that I watched sort of seem to indicate that whilst they will come out the back of the hive, just like they would come out the side of the hive if you were to you know, lift a box off, um, they seem to sort of say they know where the front is and they sort of don't necessarily come racing out the back, especially if you've got a little bit of shelter and it's a little bit darker. But um, I'm not experienced at that. That was just some of the comments that came about. But... Um, yeah, it'll, in I've also seen some hybrid versions in America where they'll build a bee house and they're kind of Langstroth's um, that slide out, but they're not technically AZ hives. And, of course, you know, they'll stick a uh, split system in there. So yeah. 
yeah. if you were that, and that's more for the beekeeper. So if you, when you were working, um, you can, um, yeah, you can stay, keep your cool, yep. <laughs> yes, which is also appealing. <laughs> attached to the back of your bees. Yeah. 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 Yep. I wonder um, how it would differ from the point of view of pest and disease management. Has anyone got any thoughts about like, what we might expect to be different on a system like this? Um, would it be any different? Um, I, I think the common pests that we all face are things here in Australia are things like small hive beetle. Um, we all ha have a little bit of issues like chalk brood occasionally, depending on how your hive's going. Um, obviously, wax moth and fowl broods um, can come and go, depending on what's going on. Um, my first thought is when you've got beehives so closely located that there's the potential for drift between hives. Um, but every time I talk about that, I get reminded, well, that's why they're so colourful. Like, there's absolutely no mistaking whose hives who. Um, they, the bees know very clearly which is theirs. So I think if you were to do something like this and do them all white, like you're not doing yourself any favours, um, you will get as much drift as, you know, I get right now with two beehives a metre apart, probably down here, probably worse. But if you're conscious of the colour selection and how you've arranged, how you arrange that, I think that would be avoidable as by vast majority. Um, and I think that all I... I guess that the benefits of them being close to each other and providing that thermal mass together may outweigh some of those some of those minor issues of the odd bee that might drift. I also wonder, I don't know, whether things by by the overall hive temperature being a bit more balanced, whether things that are common in a cold hive or a damp well worse, damp and a cold hive whether you would have those issues. So like that bit of um, bit of mould that happens in winter on in areas where there's too much space, would you get that? Um, are you you know less likely to have issues like chalk brood if the temperature is a bit more moderated? Um, I'm yet to fully understand the benefits of that, but my mind says that that probably would be a better outcome. But I just don't have I don't have conclusive proof yet that that's how it would be. How do you, you how would they, oh, sorry, Andrew. No, you go. I was going to say, how would they go in spring when they're ramping up? Like I run two brood boxes. There is no room for them to put in a second brood box and then the honey super is there. there well, this depends on how you conduct your beekeeping. So these ones here all show just two boxes. Yeah. I've got to change my wording, two levels. Um, the one that I and that's that's how it's obviously done in Slovenia with a with an excluder in between, yep. but I think that that's their that suits their conditions and it suits their type of bee. Um, absolutely, like I've got hives that would never some would not suit being left in one box in winter. They need two, mm. uh, despite the fact that I try my hardest to always leave them in just one. Is my is my goal I try to because I know that when I haven't I've, when I've had losses in years gone by is where I haven't tried hard enough to get them in one but if you can imagine um, two of those levels being committed or the lowest level being committed to your um, brood then the second and the third level really you've got a choice of how that would go you decide whether or not that needs to be another brood chamber or a double honey box but I would think that it's from what I've seen, it's often two brood with honey in the top and you're just taking honey from the very top one. But the interesting thing is how easy it is to move frames. Because just say you had a hive which was queenless and maybe no longer there was any eggs there. So you need to take a frame of eggs to put into that particular hive. No more burying down from the top through a couple of boxes to get to a frame of eggs. You open the back door, open the internal door, go straight to the brood chamber and find the one you want, redistribute the frames if that's what you need to, and move it across. Job done. Um, so I think that that's, you know, an interesting difference in this mechanism. Um, is a bit of a trade-off. 
but people do talk, absolutely do talk about the challenges of managing swarms with this method. And I don't know, Andrew, if that was a recollection you had when you were doing your research, but that keeps coming up. Deb's point is, is, is a valid one. I don't think we could, with the build-up that we get down here in the southern states, so, so easily manage just having two layers. The third layer gives you that flexibility. And in fact, like I think I think I mentioned earlier, you can close levels off completely so they're not accessible at all. Um, albeit, be careful for the, those huntsman spiders. Loretta, these spiders are as big as your head. You don't want to... <laughs> um, <laughs> So, Deb, your point's valid. I think it's just one that would be interesting to learn and understand how you manage your resources across a fixed space. You can't just go forever. Yeah. Um, my experience is three levels would be adequate for how I do my beekeeping most of the time. But who knows? I think there's still challenge in that. So is this type of um, AZ hive houses only in Slovenia? I have recently been in Germany and southern Germany. I'm sure I drove past structures that look just like that. Are they also around other parts of Europe? Um, I'd need to learn more about that, Deb, um, but I wouldn't be surprised to hear that um, given the proximity of Germany to that area. It's not it's, yeah. only, it's only one country over, really, isn't it? Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, it's pretty close. But I think that um, beekeeping at a commercial level in Europe is completely different to a commercial level in Australia. We're, we're more, we've got that similarity to North America. Yeah. Um, however, um, their commercial sector in Europe is, is much smaller um, and not necessarily always as nomadic moving around, but that's just a generalisation. So it wouldn't surprise me with what you're saying, um, but it, it could well be the same. It just seems very logical how some of this works. It's just got me bothered in a way. How come I'm not seeing more of this? Why hasn't this been something that's been done? Is there a problem with this me method? Is where, is where I land? I guess we don't have the extreme of temperatures like that. The, these areas would be snow bound over winter and they would need to be able to keep their hives <clears throat> warm over that period of time. And that's a really great way of yep. doing that. Yep. We don't have that need particularly. Yeah, and that's that's got me curious as well, if like that is one of the biggest reasons to, to not need to do a method like this, to have that heavy insulation and uh, mm. that thermal mass side yeah. of it. Um, does this method give you value in other ways? That's not just that one point you raise now. Is it? Is it the convenience of sliding something out the back as someone who doesn't want to lift lots of heavy things? Um, is it the simplicity of having a fixed structure so that you're not having to move lots of things around? Is it? Is it easier to get your frames managed? Um, don't know. Haven't figured all that out yet. And I wonder if the insulation and the veranda. You know, you could customise the roof, could actually help with our extreme summers. I suspect it would, Andrew. Um, and I don't know enough about how that'll work yet, but I suspect it would would do a very good job. I know that um, we all get moisture on the roof of our hives. Um, you know, as the bre as the bees respire and breathe, that moisture ends up on the top, and we all put mats on the top to stop that moisture going through the brood. Um, if you've got a roof structure as significant as these here, and maybe maybe I'd prefer us to point to the one in the middle being a bit more downplayed and a bit more simplistic, um, does a roof structure as heavy as that give rise to such high degree of moisture? Because that moisture really settles because of the cold on the outside and um, coming through with the warm, humid air at the top. So would we be actually minimising some of those issues in winter? Um, and then equally in summer, does that give some more um, distance and insulation between the hot sun and and the brood and the and the honey chamber brood chamber? Don't know. It, it makes sense that it would. Mm. <clears throat> I was hoping someone would come to this and go, I know all that you need to know, Simon. <laughs> but let's see the conversation starters, George. What are you thinking, mate? What's coming to mind for you? Oh, look, very interesting. Um, could probably work in uh, Victoria, especially in the Macedon Ranges where I am. It's quite cold. Yep. 
Um, but uh, yeah, it, it'd be something you'd have to look into because of the cost to set it all up. Wouldn't be cheap. Yeah. Um, I'm so, so I'm going through that at the moment, I guess, um, and putting the work in myself to to build it. Um, so time time the time factor never adds up. <laughs> that that bit never adds up ever. But from the point of view of, of you know materials, yeah, I'm finding it's quite expensive. Um, but I'll report on that as time goes on. To be honest, um, but yeah, but there is that that whole setup thing. I I I really do wonder though that if if it goes the way I think it might, and I haven't pre I haven't got a predetermined outcome in my mind, but I you know I think I can make a good rational judgment of how how the trial of these hives might go. It may change what I would recommend to new beekeepers. To be honest, that's what I that's what I'm curious is if in six or nine months from now, if someone came to me and said, "What should I do, Simon, to start off beekeeping?" Will I have a different answer for them in six or nine months' time? That's what I'm about to find out. I think if the parts and the the boxes and like even in a kit form are somehow commercially viable, it would be a lot more popular. Cool. Yeah. Um, that economies of scale thing does not work at the moment. Um, oh, here comes an expert signing in right now. That economies of scale thing doesn't work at the moment for anybody. Um, that's, that's, that's just how it is. Yeah. You'd have to be good at your woodworking, wouldn't you, to yeah. build something like that? Cool, Mac. Pleasure to have you on board, mate. Thank you for uh, dialing in. Yeah, sorry I'm late. I've just finished judo training, so sorry I look a little bit, uh, a little bit scruffed up. Oh, good work. Um, for those that uh, aren't familiar with who Cormac is, Cormac uh, lives in the Can in Canberra. Um, is responsible for looking after the hives at Parliament House and also the Slovenian Embassy, whereby he looks after some of these um, hive systems that we've been talking about tonight. Um, and Cormac has, um, not that we've spoken much over the years, Cormac, but um, you certainly seem to come up and pop up in uh, semi-frequently, um, whether the, your name is, your name seems to turn up in lots of different places, <laughs> is I suppose what I'm trying to say. Usually with swear words attached, I'm sure, yeah, yeah. No, mate, don't be like that. Um, so we've been on a, on a fair old journey tonight, Cormac, just... No one here is an expert of Slovenian beekeeping. We just we just are trying to discuss what it's all about and and learn and try and understand if this is a, a sensible direction to try in beekeeping. Um, whether or not we'd uh, you know feel we're just we were just talking then just before you arrived about the economics of, of of taking on something like a Slovenian an AZ hive system um, when you're already set up and you have you have what you have. Um, it's hard to justify any sort of change, isn't it? But um, yeah. when it comes to maybe, and the point that I was just making, um, I'll, I'll, have, I'll have some bees in a Slovenian, hybrid Slovenian hive in the next few weeks that I'm making in my garage right now. Is oh, it, cool. Is it such that in the next six to eight months after, say, say by April next year, would I be rec recommending to a person who comes up to me and says, what should I do to get started beekeeping? Would I be wanting to recommend to them this style of beekeeping, or to leave it in, with this more standard methods of beekeeping here in Australia? So that's the question I'm really curious about. But you have used these Slovenian systems. Yep. What's your take on that point? I really love it. I I think it, it especially if there's an outer housing around the bees, it gives them so much resistance to heat waves, to cold. Like it's designed for these extreme environmental conditions they find in the mountains in Slovenia, like primarily defending against cold, but equally they they really came through the heat very nicely. I think the one trap to watch out for is that if you use the like the true Slovenian style, they have like datant style and size frames, which for those of you who don't know are basically much wider and a little bit shorter than Langstroth's. So the ones that are being sold in Australia now, they all take Langstroth frames. Definitely, definitely, definitely go with that because then you can use nuke boxes, you can split, you can use standard frames. Um, the first 
experience harvesting I had with the true Slovenian hive, I found out the hard way, it does not fit into a standard extractor. Fits into a radial extractor if it's a big one, but does not fit into a um, into a standard centrifugal extractor. And it's like, uh-oh, yep. well, guess what, folks? We're crushing. <laughs> yeah, that instantly becomes a hassle and that whole idea of no one likes to waste their materials and, and waste mm. cot. Um, so that sort of confirms in a way that that hybrid method, which is which is how I intend to start to figure things yep. out, that hybrid method seems to be logical. Oh, 100%, 100%. It, it gives you, it puts you in sort of in terms of gear. Um, the other thing I found, you've got to be really disciplined in managing cross combing and cleaning your frames off. So you tend to, in a Langstreth, you tend to sort of, oh, you know, I'll clean them off once or twice a year. Um, I'd recommend making sure you keep the sides quite clean because you'll find that sliding in and out gets a lot lot less crushing of bees if you've got nice clean nice clean sides on your on your frames yep yep and um that just makes me think instantly cormac does that mean um if you're, you're using exactly the same standard langstroth frames that we all have um so there's absolutely no difference to those is that is that what you're yeah saying? The, the, the systems that i know some others have been using that hybrid one it's a standard langstroth deep and just use deeps because look, the fantastic thing is, there's no heavy lifting. Yeah. You open from the back, so they're calmer, because you're you're not you're not interacting. You're smoking the bees at the front, and then you're opening from the back, and then you're smoking from the back. So they're not exposed to cold air because you're sort of opening the, the back door a crack essentially. So they're much happier when you're inspecting, because you're not ripping, right. you're not pulling boxes apart, you're not you're sliding a frame out, having a look sliding it back in you're not even lifting the whole frame out you just for a brood inspection it's really nice because you just pop 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 and we're done and it's nice and gentle and you're not going thump 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 bang 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 so i i find they're really yeah it's a really nice system that i really recommend and i think it's very nice because yeah you'll have a much calmer experience in terms of inspecting uh for, for complete newbies though um learning and the other thing that's super handy is having a warre knife if you don't know what a warre knife is google it it's basically like a little slippy knife you can slide in between frames just to cut cross combing off and i'm i, I keep warre hives as well so this for me is is home turf and it's very nice there you go well that's um real insightful and um yeah deb did you have something to say Yes, Cormac, a uh, question. Uh, when my hives start laying their drone uh, larva and therefore they're, when they're capping it, it's often out of the frame, below the frame. Yeah. They just, so what happens in that case in the Slovenian setup? Never, never, it, they never go below the frame because unlike a mm -hmm. Langstroth where you've got to leave that gap between boxes, there's no gap. Like there's, mm -hmm. there's only a little, little gap, just enough for you to... Yep. To, to sort of break the seal then slide the frame out so you don't you don't actually have that problem you don't have the the sort of the crushed drone brood or mm -hmm. if you yeah if they ever grow sort of underneath the bars you tend to just sort of scrape it off as you go which does you know they don't like you squashing the boys but it's not like you're going to lose any production with a couple there's guys don't really do anything useful they just you know sit around and eat too much just like us regular guys so <laughs> <laughs> great thanks what about um, pests and diseases? Um, I've got a like a a loose thought that if they're better thermal, if they're managed more thermally sensibly, which this system seems to do, um, that they've probably got a better coping ability. They're going to have let fewer extremes inside the hive. Is, is that definitely, def definitely much more stable. Um, yeah, and you will find more small hive beetle will persist in the hive because oh, wow. it's warmer. Ah, but yeah. but you've got you've got a floor. And they're running around the floor, and a cassette trap gets them gets them beautifully. Yeah. Because and also it's easy to move. You can, this is the other thing, you can intervene even in winter because you can open the back door and have a quick look. Yep. So you can actually effectively, and they've got screens at the back, so you can actually look inside the hive and have a look. And the I mean the Slovenians they they inspect all year all through winter because they've got a house built around the hive. Um, 
for some strange reason, my partner won't let me uh, knock holes in the walls and, and put a hive in the back room, but it's just weird, huh? But look, if, if you could build them in a shed, that'd be ideal because that's that's the system they use. Um, they're basically their honey shed. One wall is hives. Yep. Um, and the other thing is because the, the, the air is concentrated, you can smell stuff like, like imagine Falbrid, you'd immediately spot it. Um, for instance, um, so that's that's sort of one thing. But also, yeah, a small hive beetle, you just got to trap them. You got to make sure you got a trap in there most of the time, because they will they will be able to persist in that warmer environment much much more easily. Good point. Um, honey, we were talking before about honey extraction, and yep. um, that the frames are still wide, often up and down as opposed to across. Yeah, yeah, they're sort of, it's a bit strange. Uh, um, that's obviously for the particular AZ frames. If you're using Langstroth, is the... the uh, it, it seems more of a tradition all than anything else. Is that all it is? It's not really that's all it is. Like, the ones that I got, they they drilled them straight over for me. Like, they just put pop, 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 and I just strung wire through like you would a normal Langstroth frame. And that was, and they said, oh, that's fine. Like, they they have like a lot of traditions, like for instance, the front being painted and and the, the triangular frame wire. I do do that triangular framing system for my Langstroth, so, and that, because I just have a top strip and then the, the, the V holds it in place when I'm extracting, but that makes it just a little bit easier to cut comb out. So for me, it was it was fine. I mean, honestly, it was, it was a snap. Like I just cut, when I'm extracting from the ones, because they don't fit into extractor, Yep. But I'm Warre beekeeper and a top bar beekeeper. I've got a crusher. So I just, you know, I just cut out, pop, 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 shake all the bees off, cut out, straight back in, away she goes, you know, off we off we go. Yeah, no, that sounds great. Did did you guys, um, and Michelle, I haven't asked any questions of you at this point. I think it's because I keep seeing it in the dark and not realising that you're there. Is there anything that you were curious about or any questions that you had? Um, just wanted to make sure you had an opportunity to to chime in if if, if you wanted to. Just see you there. <laughs> um, well, while we're at it, anyone else that's um, got any questions or thoughts or any curiosities that they want to, or itches they want to scratch? Uh, Simon, if I can say something. Please. Yeah. yeah. During this uh, the recent uh, conference in Slovenia, you know, all the facilitators uh, accompanying the youngsters for this conference, uh, we were given, a, there was a workshop uh, for about a couple of hours on how to build these AZ hives. In fact, uh, I have the contact card of this person. If you all are interested, perhaps I can, you know, connect you. Uh, and he gave a practical thing on how it is built from scratch to, uh, you know, till the complete uh, thing. And there was a thing of the how the honey is also extracted, a procedure. So perhaps I can share that uh, with you. I'll get in touch with him and share that. Uh, um, splendid. Thank you. Absolutely wonderful. No, I'm just... I'm just wondering if there is an extractor overseas that they um, use. So um, that would be might interesting. Do, what might they do in Slovenia with their standard AZ frames? Are they using a different extraction method, do you know? They're, they're using a radial. Uh, the ones I've seen, they're using a radial, radial extractor. Yep. So that's the one, instead of them sitting like like against the, the wall, like flat, they're, yep. they're, 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 they're facing in with the frame, the cells facing back, basically back towards you at the outer wall and it's spun around that way. And that way you like, that would, they would fit all of our radial extractors too. There's no problem. Like, yep. Um, I'm working on something to get honey out of beehives that makes life easier too. So it might fit mm. nicely to um, a Slovenian system in the future. <laughs> I think they were oh, thinking of mucking around with some sort of flow frame style system. But I mean, for, for me, the advantage I've got is that the Slovenian embassy wants to run Carniolans because that, that's a Slovenian bee. They have quite a fast turnover of brood. So I'm actually playing, I'm actually cutting and straining in preference, mainly because I want to get the, 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 the dark wax out. Yeah. Um, so I'm actually taking a brood frame out, making sure the queen's not on it, moving it up, fills with honey, then taking it out, cut, 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 put it back in the brood chamber to fill up with fresh wax. So I'm cycling the wax 
yep. quite hard because they, the Coney Islands fourth, they really, I mean, you'd know, they, they really, they really hammer along when, when it's a good season. Yep. Yep. Look, we've talked for a fair while now, guys. Um, so I don't want to uh, drag people along any longer than they want to, but is there any other questions or thoughts or, or comments? Um, I'm intrigued. I just got one. Um, you mentioned in passing Cormac, um, commercial like the frames available, the systems available in Australia suit Langstroth. Um, I've struggled to find anyone that sells AZ Hive components or kits or anything like that. Are you was that a passing reference to someone you're aware of or companies? That yeah, might be there's a company. Them? There's a company just at Murrum Bateman, just north of me, and they were they were selling. Um, and they were selling kits that, that fit Langstroth's, Langstroth frames. Mm. Yeah. So you I, sort I, of supply the, the building or the trailer or the caravan and then, then you slot these Yeah, in, so the, that's the downside. Like they're just giving you the, the, the essentially the, the, the frame, the hive body. You've got to build some sort of something around it. But honestly, it can be as simple as just a sh like a little mini shed you knock together. Because you've only got to get three sides and a door to fit in. Like it's, it's not that yeah. challenging. No, I've, I've just got a very militant council, so <laughs> they'd want. Oh, that's perfect because you permit. can hide it. <laughs> like you can hide it inside other things. <laughs> They'll <Yeah>. never know. <laughs> uh, there you go. I'll just quickly go around the room. Um, anyone else got any anything else they want to add or or say? I'll, I'm keen to report back. Um, how I go. I'll uh, try and do a little bit of that. I'll, I'll log it on Hive Buddy. So um, if you, for those of you that are a member of Hive Buddy, you'll see, you'll see some progress happenings there. Um, I'll make a little subsection there so that, um, yeah, for those that are curious, they can see what's going on. And if you do find that you're going down this path or you want to learn more, just keep reaching out. We'll uh, keep having conversations uh, every now and again and just see what happens, really. Um, Simon, you might be might be coming one of the manufacturers. Uh, yeah, it's possible. I've got someone yeah, who's a niche sort of thing. There's definitely a niche there. <laughs> yeah, oh, there is. Um, I, I, I see. I do see that. Like, I don't. I don't have great skills in that department. They're good enough to try something. They're not good enough to sell something. Um, <laughs> I can... that, that was the same as flow hive people too. Oh, that's look, I'm yeah, that's, that's how they right. started. They were just mucking around. I'm, I'm working hard in other areas at the moment. <laughs> um, but um, no, you're absolutely right, Michelle. So let's see what happens. I, I need to find out whether it's worth the uh, effort to begin with. I've got a hunch that it will be. Um, mm. But experience is, is the most important thing right now. So let's see what the next six months bring. Yeah. Oh, well done, everyone. Um, it's been a pleasure having you all there. Thanks, Cormac, for um, some of your wisdom because we um, were otherwise going off my maybe 20 hours of research, um, which is all it was. Um, and six hours of building one. Um, so it's great to have you listening in. And Loretta, thanks for dialing in from so far away. It's great to see you again. Um, and there's some regulars here too. So thanks for thanks for being here. Thanks for a great night. Enjoyed the chat. Bye. -bye. Yep. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Good to see yeah. you. Thanks, Cormac. Cheers. See you, folks. No, great go chat. Sorry, I'm so late. <laughs> <laughs> You're all right, mate. Take care, Ron. No worries. See you.